آؤزبلّہمن شیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قول رب شرح علی صدری و یسر علی عمری وحل العقدم من لسانی یفقہ قولی صدق اللہ العظیم آئی سیک ہیلپ ان اللہ فرام شیطان دا ایکیوزڈ ون ان دا نیم آف اللہ دا موسٹ گریشیس دا موسٹ مرسیفل موسیز سیڈ مائی لارڈ ایکسپینڈ فار می مائی چیسٹ with assurance, and ease for me my task, and untie the knot from my tongue, that they may understand my speech. Allah, the Magnificent, has spoken the truth. Thank you very much. Excellencies, honorable panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure as a member of the Global Monitoring Report Advisory Board to host today's launch of the GMR 2013-14 in Islamabad, Pakistan. And it is a double honor, as we said to our Honorable Minister of Education from Afghanistan, that today two ministers from Afghanistan and Pakistan are really co-hosting this event. And we are very honored to be facilitating this. South Asia is home to one-fifth of the world's population, rich in civilizations, heritage, diversity, and best practices but is challenged by extreme inequality with respect to human development, gender, and well-being. Globally, 57 million children do not learn because they are not in school. And of those who are in school, 250 million children fail to learn at primary level. Sadly, many of those reside in this region. To the passionate educators, the hope of reducing inequality, eradicating poverty, and instability in increasing democratic participation lies in unequivocal support to learning and quality education. This line of thinking is supported by robust evidence on how measurable learning can comprehensively influence improvement in health, nutrition, population, opportunities for economic growth, and entitlements. However, the key lies in making learning a central lever for which Capable, well-supported, and active facilitator teachers are the frontline agents. This is the central focus of today's 11th global and regional launch of the Global Monitoring Report 2013-14. Um, and as you know, that today, concurrently, the global and the regional monitoring report are being launched in Addis Ababa and in Pakistan. The, globe, the Global Monitoring Report is aptly titled Teaching and Learning, Achieving Quality for All. GMR each year tracks the six EFA goals and MDGs two and three. Its timing is special for us this year as is the, as is the theme in the lead up to 2015 and post 2015 dialogues and debates on learning at all levels as a central education development agenda. We are honored to have with us a very grounded and esteemed panel of speakers from the region to speak about the themes from their own experience, perspectives, and possibilities as teachers, activists, thinkers, and policymakers. The panelists that we have today are not any ordinary panel. And I think it's going to be an exciting uh, day, morning today for us to hear from each one of us their perspectives on the theme of the Global Monitoring Report. As I, before I begin um, the introductions to the panelists, may I just all request uh, to the August audience here to keep their mobiles on silent so that we can have a very good flow of the entire um, program. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, His Excellency Mohammed Bali Rahman. Minister of State for Education, Trainings, and Standards in Higher Education, Pakistan. Baligur Rahman Saab is an elected member of the National Assembly, is the Minister of State for Education, Trainings, and Standards in Higher Education. He is the political assistant of the Chief Minister of the Punjab Province and the Divisional Coordinator of the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz Group. Mohammed Bali Rahman Saab assumed charge of the ministry with the vision to make Pakistan a developed, and prosperous nation by creating equitable opportunities in education. His Excellency Dr. Farooq Yawardak, Minister of Education, Afghanistan, 
In 20, April 2010, Afghanistan's president appointed Ghulam Farooq Wardak as the chairman of the commission responsible for holding the first ever national consultative peace assembly and later as its operational manager, bringing together 1,700 representatives from all walks of life in Afghanistan. The commission put forth a declaration for bringing a lasting peace and reconciliation in the country. In November 2010, he was also elected as chairman of the International Affairs Committee of the High Peace Council established by the president following recommendations of the National Consultative Peace Assembly alongside his job as the Minister of Education. As part of his three-year career as the Minister of Education of Afghanistan, Ghulam Farooq Sahib has secured the membership of Global Partnership for Education. He has spent 23 years in Pakistan and is also a graduate from the Punjab University. So he's very much our own. We, have, we are so honored that the UNESCO delegate has arrived. We have Dr. Kwang uh, Jo Kim, who's the director, UNESCO Asian Pacific Regional Bureau for Education, Thailand, since 2009. Dr. Kim began his senior responsibilities in Korea, where he advised and assisted former President Young Sam Kim in the fields of education and social policy from 1995 to 97. He's played a key role in the planning of the nationwide education reform initiative entitled 531 Education Reform, aimed at restructuring the entire Korean education system. Dr. Kim was affiliated with the Burl Bank headquarters. In 2004, Dr. Kim was appointed Director General of the Ministry of Education and Human Resources Development in Korea, where he led and prepared cross-ministerial human resource policies the five-year National Human Resource Development Plan from 2005 to 8. Dr. Kim was also Deputy Minister of Education and Human Resource Development of the Republic of Korea. In 2009, Dr. Kim has been appointed, has been serving as the UNESCO Regional Bureau for Education in Asia Pacific, as well as the UNESCO representative to Thailand, Laos, PDR, Myanmar, and Singapore. We are also honored that we have His Excellency Ahmed Bakshleri Saab, Federal Secretary, Ministry for Education, Trainings and Standards in Higher Education. Um, Lady Saab is uh, absolutely a seasoned uh, bureaucrat, um, a great manager and a team leader. He has um, uh, attended several uh, eminent programs all over the world um, for his professional development. He served as the Chief Secretary of Balochistan and additional Chief Secretary uh, Development Balochistan and DG, Director General of the Gwadar Development Authority. I think the first um, uh, Director General of the Gwadar Development Authority. Secretary of Education Department um, Balochistan and was the first, uh, also served as the Federal Secretary of the Ministry of Housing and Works. He introduced the Champions of Reform program, a first of its kind civil society-based socioeconomic participatory development initiative. We have also with us um, from the region, Farida Lambe, who's uh, co-founded uh, Pratham, the famous organization in India uh, with a uh, countrywide presence uh, in 1994 with Dr. Madhav Chavan and is responsible for the direct programs in Mumbai and Gujarat as well as Pratham's Council for, Council for Vulnerable Children across India. In addition to her work at Pratham, Farida Lambe is former vice principal of the Nirmala Niketan College of Social Work in Mumbai. Ms. Farida Lambe has been responsible for national level policy changes in child labor and education. She currently serves on the Government of India Committee on Child Labor and Research and Education and was recently nominated a member of the National Advisory Committee under the Child Labor Prohibition and Regulation Act 1980, 1986. Ms. Farida Lambe has also been recently appointed as member of the Maharashtra State Commission for the Protection of Child Rights and has initiated programs, Prerna and Yuva, for vulnerable girls and youth. Farida Rambe has also spearheaded disaster relief efforts uh, during the 1992 Bombay riots, the latter earthquake, Orissa cyclone, um, 26-11 Mumbai floods and Bihar floods, Mumbai terror attacks, and recent Uttarakhand tragedy, to name a few. We are also honored um, today to have teachers with us from the field. We have with us principal of Malai Girls High School, Kabul, Afghanistan, Shafika Vardak, who began teaching in 1988. Shafika has a vast experience in the field of education with a degree in law from Kabul University. She has represented Afghanistan's education sector 
a number of times abroad. In 2012, she was invited by the British Council to the UK to the Conference of Administration and Management. She has 23 years of association with the education sector and has been uh, uh, exposed to diverse teaching techniques and administration uh, challenges. She has a long association with several educational institution, uh, institutions in Afghanistan. Um, she's the director of the Aisha Durani Girls High School Kabul from 2008 to 13, and, and director of Malika Suraya Girls High School in 2008 um, of Shino Girls High School. Um, we have, or we are also honored in terms of the um, South Asian presence to have Khaldia Ismin, who is a teacher in the BRAC non-formal primary school in a village in Bangladesh. She has been working with BRAC as a non-formal primary teacher since 1989. Before joining the BRAC school, she completed her secondary school certificate in 1983 and higher secondary certificate in 1992. In order to work as a BRAC teacher, she received basic training from BRAC, where she learned much about the concepts of learning theory and practice. In addition to that, she also received training from uh, specifically on mathematics. Further to this, she attended a four-month training court on a course on English language and, um, organized by the Center of Language um, um, BRAC, at BRAC University. We have also today with us from Pakistan and from Islamabad Capital Territory, right at the extreme end, Fawzia Amreen, who is the deputy headmistress at the primary model school number two, um, one um, oblique nine four in Islamabad. Fawzia has been a teacher for more than eight years and she's completed her bachelor's in science in 2003 from, from the Federal College of, Edu of Education. And we'll may have hear more about her uh, aspirations in professional development. She is currently also pursuing masters in education. She's joined the Federal, Federal Directorate of Education System in 2005 and has been involved in teaching for the past eight years. She was also the focal per person for a project on inclusive education, which has inspired her much, and we'll hear more from about, about that as well from her. And she has received many training college, uh, courses on inclusive education, strategic time man management, and subject-based teaching. She tries to adapt techniques of inclusive education to tap special needs of children, such as those who have different abilities in vision, physical health characteristics, and critical thinking to help the progress and development of the child. We are finally, some, uh, we have with us from the Global Monitoring uh, Report team from Paris, Senior Policy Analyst at the Education for All GMR, Mano, Dr. Manos Antonis. Dr. Manos Antonis uh, joined the GMR team in August 2011 from the Oxford Policy Management, and he's an avid traveler who traveled this entire region, including and spent time in Pakistan. He's a develop, um, he has worked in development policy consultancy and is a monitoring and evaluation expert in education sector projects, including a public expenditure tracking and service delivery survey of secondary education provision in Bangladesh, the evaluation of a basic project in the western provinces of China, the midterm evaluation of education for all fast track initiative, the annual reporting of progress in the implementation of the second primary education development in, Bang in Bangladesh, as well as working in Nigeria with evaluation in service cluster based training, um, not just in Nigeria but also in Pakistan. He's worked in uh, the out of school global, children's global initiative in Indonesia, and he's amply qualified to do all of this and much more. We are excited today because this is. Um, uh, a special report, as I just mentioned, and it is special because of the title of the report and the way it has been designed, and as you will see shortly. Um, I know this has been um, a slightly extended introduction, but I thought people should know who is uh, represented here and what they bring and the passion that they bring to this Global Monitoring Report uh, launch 2014. May I now request um, His Excellency, Mr. Baligur Rahman, Minister of State, to give his um, welcome address uh, to our gathering. Uh, Baligur Rahman Saab. Honorable Minister of Education, Republic of Afghanistan, Mr. Farooq Wardak Sahab. Regional Director, Mr. Kim from UNESCO, Thailand. Worthy delegates, ladies and gentlemen, worthy guests, Secretary, Education, 
and many distinguished teachers and guests from abroad, many educationists I see here. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. On behalf of the government of Pakistan, I warmly welcome you all to this important event of South and West Asia launch of Global Monitoring Report. UNESCO GMR team deserves our sincere appreciation and acknowledgement for their excellent and outstanding efforts in preparing this invaluable report, regularly published over the last decade, and for their support and hard work in recognizing this regional launch simultaneously in Pakistan, Ethiopia, and Mexico. Developed by an independent team and published by UNESCO, the Education for All Global Monitoring Report is an authoritative reference that aims to inform, influence, and sustain genuine commitment towards education for all. All this report is the prime instrument to assess global progress towards achieving the six Dakar EFA goals. It tracks progress, identifies effective policy reforms, and best practice in all areas relating to EFA draws attention to emerging challenges, and seeks to promote international cooperation in favor of education. The publication is of immense value for the policymakers, managers, civil society organizations, teachers, scholars, and researchers in the field of education and social development. As they say, the solution to a problem starts by realizing the problem. Pakistan is unfortunately lagging behind in achieving education for all goals, and at current pace of progress, we may miss several targets by year 2015. There are millions of children in Pakistan who are not attending schools. We are also behind our target for other education-related indicators, including early childhood care and education, literacy rate, gender parity in education, etc. Pakistan has now new government of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, which comes with dedication, commitment, and resolve towards education. In order to rectify the prevailing conditions in the education sector, we have taken a number of initiatives, which include a comprehensive and objective review of our plans and strategies during the last 13 years to achieve EFA targets and to assess our feasible education agenda for the post-2015 period. This process will also help us clearly identify the successful and effective models on which we can build our future plans. We have prepared a national plan of action to accelerate the progress towards education MDGs. Around 5 million children are planned to be enrolled in the next three years, and specific steps will be taken to ensure increased retention in the schools. We are also planning to initiate projects and programs for providing and enabling government to girls in the backward regions for their easy access to quality education. This initiative is a part of our collaboration with UNESCO under Malala Fund, for which many basic modalities have been finalized. Innovative solutions and use of technology like mobile learning and tabs will be used to expand the access of education and literacy services. Above all, we have made education as a fundamental right of every children in Pakistan through 18th Constitutional Amendment, which was passed a few years ago. Both the federal government and the provincial governments are committed and are taking every possible step to ensure that every child in Pakistan is able to attend the school and learn. Many initiatives for youth of Pakistan have been started by the current government. Prime Minister's literacy drive is also being finalized, which will inshallah give full thrust to the efforts for literacy and education. We plan to take spending on education to 4% of our GDP from the current decimal ratio of 2%. The South and West Asia region has an immense potential to grow and to improve socioeconomic conditions of its population. We all are working to see that our future generations are able to live in an environment of peace, progress, and prosperity. But these dreams can never be achieved if we fail to cooperate with each other 
and the world outside to make concerted efforts for the benefit of everyone. We need to enhance international and regional cooperation in the fields of education, technical and vocational training, as well as in research and development. I'm sure that our mutual cooperation will make our dreams come true. At the end, I once again congratulate UNESCO and the GMR team for their excellent work and arranging this event jointly with the Government of Pakistan. To His Excellency Mr. Farooq Wardak, Minister of Education, Afghanistan. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. I am honored to represent Afghanistan children in youth in such a distinguished audience where everyone is driven by the sole purpose of serving humanity and its future. I am also grateful to the organizer, Ministry of Education, Government of Islamic Republic of Pakistan, UNESCO, and the GMR team for organizing and hosting the GMR launch event in the beautiful city of Islamabad and giving me the chance and opportunity to share my experiences of education development and conflict situation. As part of our struggle for a peaceful region, we view education development not only as the foundation for stable and prospering nations, but also as the driver for durable peace, sustained growth, social and justice, as well as legitimacy of our institutions. Timely and adequate investment in education is crucial because it is a prerequisite for both economic growth and political stability as economic growth and political stability, peace, reintegration, and economic growth cannot be achieved without educated, healthy, and productive citizens. As members of the international community, we need to collectively invest more in education, science, technology, innovation, and collective growth, which will indeed promote our goal of peaceful coexistence and respect for human dignity and diversity. The new GMR reminds us that progress towards universal schooling remains challenging in the poor and conflict-affected areas, including this region. And quality learning for children and youth across the globe seems daunting at the face of national resource constraint and aid reduction. But the report also warns us that we have no time to waste. We must ensure that we collectively meet the fast approaching MDG and education for all goal and place education at the center of post-2015 global development framework. Moving forward, unity of purpose and collaboration between governments, agencies, public and private institutions are much needed sources of strength and hope for millions of out-of-school children and their families. Excellencies, I am honored to state that development of education in my country is the most successful legacy of the world community partnership with the people of Afghanistan over the last 12 years. Our education journey signifies that our nation, which has suffered from the tyranny of violent conflict, still has strong aspiration for a better tomorrow in a safer and well-educated Afghanistan. We have been able to transform a disabled, ill-functioning, and neglected education system of 2001, which was providing poor quality education to less than one million students with no girls, to a progressive, responsive, and inclusive education system of today that serves 10 and a half million Afghan children and youth with 42% girls. We acknowledge with gratitude the fact that Without the support of our friends and the international community, we would not have been able to bring this degree of unprecedented transformation. Distinguished colleagues, our experiences in Afghanistan confirms the simple fact that challenges can be converted into opportunities only if right strategies are chosen. I am pleased to share some of these strategies that have proven instrumental in education development in Afghanistan, which are as follows. First, community ownership. We have placed community mobilization and people participation in education at the heart of our strategic focus to protect schools, 
to encourage parents to send their children to schools, to monitor school performance, and to offer alternative pathways. This strategy is being further refined to make sure that the community is the ultimate owner of our ed education system. Second, integration of informal education. In order to meet the divergent needs of our people, we enhanced cohesion across our formal education system in various informal pathways, such as community-based and mask-based education, preschool and accelerated learning programs. Third, restructuring and reform. Over the last one decade, in addition to addressing a huge backlog of eight million children who were either in the school age or growing out of it and had no access to education, and 13 million illiterate adults, we, we also had to rebuild, restructure, and reform a shattered education system and make it responsive to the growing needs of our people. Fourth, securing finances for education. Because of our advocacy for education for all, and the past seven years, we have doubled the share of education in our national budget from US dollar 260 million in 2007 to about 600 million dollars in 2013. We are committed to continue our effort to steadily increase allocation for education out of Afghanistan's national budget. Fifth, public and private partnership. Allowing the people to join hands with the government in the providing educational services is a recent phenomena of only seven years. While facilitating private sector to educate our kids, we kept our regulating and monitoring role so we can protect the interest of our public. Sixth, global and regional partnership. In order to reach every Afghan child, especially the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the hard to reach, we had to turn many stones that got us seven high value regional and international partnership, namely Global Partnership for Education, UK Global Girls Education Challenges Fund, United Nations Secretary General's Global Education First, USAID Room to Learn, Qatar's Educator Child, and ECO and SARCs. Collectively, all these partnerships will contribute significantly to our providing of education to all goals. Seventh, application of lesson learned. Our consistent search for best practices and proven models granted us opportunities to benefit from the open schooling, distance learning, and functional literacy, which assisted us in addressing the varied needs of our diverse communities. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the achievement, we are faced with a number of challenges in our education development, some, some of which are as follows. About 20% of our school age children, majority of them girls, do not have access to education, mainly because of insecurity, lack of school facilities, shortage of qualified teacher, particularly female and cultural constraint in some part of our country. B, over 8 million adults, which make 25% of our population are still illiterate and lack employable skills. Third, 50% of our school, existing schools do not have buildings and other necessities. Fourth, only 50% of our teachers possess the minimum required qualification of grade 14 graduation. We know that the challenges are immense, but our commitment and resilience are stronger, and we are determined to make Afghanistan a stable and prosperous country that is a responsible member of the world community and contribute to global peace and development. Dear colleagues, according to JMR, due to lack of adequate attention to education quality and ignoring the marginalized 250 million children, majority of them in this region, or not learning the basics, let alone the further skill they need to get decent work and lead full, uh, uh, fulfilling lives. I understand that the problem is not of one specific country, but it is a regional and worldwide tragedy to overcome regional calamities, regional cooperation is needed. I also have noted that declining domestic funding in majority of the countries and decreasing ODA by major donors stagnate over all progress toward education for all goals. But we also need to prevent waste in our systems 
manage effectively and efficiently and innovate smart strategy and focus on teachers and the learning environment for quality learning. We believe that through partnership with UNESCO, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other countries in this region, by sharing their best practices, can bring a revolution in their education system. Also, we request UNESCO and the international community to increase its advocacy and assistance to education for both Pakistan and Afghanistan to overcome the regional challenges in front of education. Dear colleagues, Afghanistan was the first country condemning the terrorist attack on Malala Yousafzai. Over 10 and a half million students came out to the street praying for her quick recovery. These youth and children also demanded the world community to support the cause for which Malala and hundreds of girls like Malala from Afghanistan and Pakistan have been giving their ultimate sacrifices at the face of evil designed by the enemies of mankind, the evil of terrorism and extremism. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to use this platform to appeal to all nations of the world, including the rich and powerful, to spend less on arms and weapons and invest more in education for all, because investment in education is the most viable means to lasting global growth, development, and peace. As someone who has ex first-hand experiences how vulnerable an uneducated population is ag against exploitation, I call upon you and through you, all the world decision makers, to invest more in education today to prevent the debilitating human calamity of tomorrow and promote global peace and prosperity. It is not the shortage of war machines that our world suffers from, rather it is the lack of equitable access to quality education that makes all of us prone to distrust, violence, and war. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by reassuring every one of you that Afghanistan will remain an ardent and dedicated partner of the world community in accomplishing the global mission of Millennium Development Goal, including the Education for All Goal. I thank you very much once again for all the preparation and for hosting this worthy seminar and gathering. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. On the energizing, powerful note of overcoming regional calamities, instability, and quality, um, regional cooperation is needed. Thank you. Uh, Minister Dr. Vardak, um, it is indeed my honor at this point to um, ask Manos Antonones from the Global Monitoring Report team from Paris to introduce and share with us the 11th Global and Regional launch of the GMR titled Teaching and Learning, Achieving Quality for All. Manos. Thank you very much. Welcome to the launch. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, and there have been so many of you, for uh, sparing no efforts to organize this event. Education for All is a global uh, movement led by UNESCO, and in 2000, 164 governments agreed a set of six international education goals. Two years later, this report uh, was introduced to provide an independent look to monitor progress towards achieving these goals by 2000. And, 15. and every year, this report also casts its eye at uh, a theme of particular importance. This year, the theme is the global learning crisis and the vital role that teachers can play in ensuring that all children, including the most disadvantaged, are learning. The key messages for the 11th EFA Global Monitoring Report are as follows. Despite some progress, 57 million children are still out of school. The number of illiterate adults has not really changed over the past decade. As a result, the global education for all goals will not be reached by the 2015 deadline. There is a global learning crisis that is hitting the disadvantaged hardest. It is not enough just to go to school. Children must also learn why they're there. But almost four in 10 children of primary school age are not learning the basics, whether in school or not. And it is a disadvantage, including the poor, 
the girls, those living in remote areas, those suffering from disabilities, those living in conflict-affected countries that are hit hardest. Good quality education cannot be achieved without good quality teachers. So policymakers urgently need to make sure that there are sufficient teachers well prepared with appropriate training to support the learning of disadvantaged children. Looking ahead, global education goals after 2015 must track progress of the marginalized, must put equity at the heart to make sure all children and young people, regardless of their background, are in school and learning. And these goals, looking into the future, must also include specific targets to finance, making sure no one is left behind due to lack of resources. As this graph shows, the number of children out of school has declined since 1999. However, this progress has slowed dramatically since 2008. Of even greater concern is that the number of out-of-school adolescents of lower secondary school age has declined even more slowly. In South and West Asia, after an initial decline, there has been near stagnation since 2004. While in Sub-Saharan Africa, the number has remained unchanged since 1999. This graph identifies with the green bar the percentage of countries likely to achieve each EFA goal by 2015. It shows that many countries will not reach the targets. Taking, for example, the second goal. By 2015, 56% of countries are likely to have reached the target of universal primary education. And only 46% are likely to achieve a target of universal lower secondary education, corresponding to goal three. Greater progress has been achieved towards gender parity, goal five. By 2015, 70% of countries are projected to reach gender parity in primary education. But let us not forget that this goal by exception, should have been achieved already by 2005. Insufficient progress towards education goals reveals a failure to reach the marginalized. In Sub-Saharan Africa, at recent rates of progress, all richest boys will complete primary school by 2021, top row, and lower secondary school by 2041, top row of the second of the lower panel. However, all poorest girls in that region will only complete primary school, I repeat, at current rates of progress, by 2086, and lower secondary school by 2111. Post-2015 goals must be measured using indicators that show the gap between the most advantaged and the most disadvantaged, making sure this gap narrows by the projected target date of 2030. The success of countries in achieving education goals is affected by whether they have sufficient finance, among other factors. However, there is currently an annual finance gap of $26 billion for basic education in low-income countries. Even though domestic resources are the main source of financing, the poorest countries still need aid. But aid to basic education fell by 6% between 2010 and 2011, its first decrease since 2002. And it is low-income countries that have been particularly affected. They receive only 1.9 billion for basic education. And more than half of these countries experience a reduction in funding between 2010 and 2011. Post-2015 goals must therefore make sure that no one is left behind due to a lack of resources. As I mentioned, this year's report focuses on the sixth education for all goal, improving the quality of education and ensuring that measurable learning outcomes are achieved by all. And it shows that there is a global learning crisis and that policymakers need to support teachers to overcome this crisis. As previous speakers have already suggested, 
We estimate that 250 million children are not learning the basics. This is equivalent to 38% of all children of primary school age. This figure is roughly equally split between those who just don't even make it to at least grade four, but also those who do, but are found not to have mastered the basics. The majority of these children live in poor countries and come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Unable to even read a sentence, then they cannot therefore um, progress to secondary education where they could acquire foundation skills. And there is a vast divide to which I attract your attention in achievement between regions. In North America and Western Europe, 96% of children achieve the minimum learning standards in reading. By contrast, only one third of children in South and West Asia do so, and two fifths, less than two fifths in Sub-Saharan Africa. These two regions account for 75% of the global population of children not reaching the minimum learning threshold. In 21 out of 85 countries that we have with full data, less than half of children are learning that. And of these, 17 are in Sub-Saharan Africa, but of the remaining four, India and Pakistan are two. Insufficient spending on education, which in many cases drives that, is a false economy. It is creating the learning crisis that has costs not only for the current generation of children and their future ambitions, but also for the current finances of governments. We have estimated that the annual cost of children in school not learning the basics is equivalent to $129 billion. That's equivalent to 10% of global spending on education. While average figures on learning achievement provide an overall picture of the scale of the learning crisis, they can conceal large disparities between countries. What a child is learning is strongly influenced by the family, their family's wealth. We show this by using 2,000 data from the ASA surveys in India and Pakistan. In India, 29% of um, the poorest children are achieving the basics in grade five in reading. However, taking into account that only seven in 10 children from that group reach grade five, essentially what we find is that only one in five of the poorest children reach the minimum learning standards in reading. In Pakistan, those children that do make it to grade five are doing somewhat better. So of the poorest children, 41% are reaching the minimum standards in reading in grade five. However, only 24% of children, of the poorest children, reached this uh, grade. As a result, taking the cohort of all children, of all poorest children as a whole, only one in 10 reached the minimum learning standard in reading. The poor quality of education is leaving a legacy of illiteracy. Around 175 million young people in low and lower middle income countries cannot read all or part of a sentence. This is equivalent to around a quarter of the youth population. In sub-Saharan Africa, 40% of young people are unable to do so. And it is young women who bear the brunt, making up 61% of youth who are not literate. In South and West Asia, this rises to 66%. We must therefore galvanize special efforts to ensure that all children are in school and learning. And teachers are a vital part of the solution to the global learning crisis. This report identifies four strategies to provide the best teachers to reach all children with good quality education. First, recruit the best teachers from a wide range of backgrounds. Second, train all teachers well, both before and during their careers. Third, allocate teachers effectively by offering incentives to teach in disadvantaged areas. And fourth, retain teachers through improved working conditions and career progression paths. I'll go through these in some more detail. The first strategy, 
recruiting the best candidates, concerns the recruitment of sufficient number of teachers to reduce the number of pupils per teacher. In addition to 3.7 million teachers who are required to replace those leaving the, the profession due to retirement or ill health, 1.6 million additional teachers are needed to achieve universal primary education by 2015. Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 60% of those additional teachers, or for nine out of 10 countries with the highest needs, the exception being Pakistan. At current rates of recruitment, 29 countries will not even be able to fill their teacher gap by 2030. And the challenge becomes even greater when we come to consider the needs for lower secondary education. An additional one million teachers are required by 2030 in South and West Asia. The first step to getting good teachers is to attract the most motivated candidates. But it is not enough just to want to teach. People should enter the profession having received a good education themselves. They need to have at least completed secondary education of appropriate quality and relevance so that they have a sound knowledge of the subjects they will be teach and to actually be able to acquire the skills they need to teach. In countries with wide gender disparities in education, there is often also a lack of female teachers. An imbalance of that kind can have adverse consequences for girls' learning opportunities. A study in Punjab province in Pakistan found that girls' test scores were higher if they had a female teacher. In Afghanistan, less than 30% of those in initial teacher education were female in 2008. But the plan is to increase the number of female teachers by 50% by 2014 through monetary and housing incentives and special training programs for women in remote areas or those who do not have currently uh, the required qualifications. Recruiting teachers from underrepresented groups to work in their own communities also guarantees that children have teachers familiar with their own culture and language. We identify in the reports Cambodia as a positive example of a country that actively looked to diversify its teacher pool, recruiting from ethnic minorities. The second strategy. Teachers need not only be recruited, but also be trained. In one out of three countries, less than 75% of teachers are trained to national standard. This results in a gap between the number of pupils taught by a teacher versus the number of pupils taught by a trained teacher. Bangladesh, for example, meets the standard of 40 pupils per teacher. However, there are more than 60 pupils per trained teacher. And it is not just new teachers, but also teachers who are already in place who need to be trained. Mali, for example, recruited teachers at a very fast pace in the last few years. However, many of those are untrained. There are currently 92 pupils for every trained teacher. And if the past trend continues, the country will not achieve a ratio of 40 pupils per trained teacher before 2030. <coughs> Policymakers must provide good quality pre-service and ongoing teacher education. Teachers must have good subject knowledge. In low-income countries, they often lack that because their own education has been poor. Teachers must be equipped to meet the needs of those from disadvantaged backgrounds, including those in remote schools. In such settings, teachers often need to teach multiple grades and ages in the same classroom. In Sri Lanka, training teachers to develop lesson plans for such classes had a positive impact on pupil achievement. Teachers need also to be trained in the use of assessment tools to be able to detect and address learning difficulties early. Yet, this is rarely part of the initial teacher education programs. In Egypt, training teachers in early grade reading instruction had a very positive impact on children's learning. Teacher trainees should have classroom experience but this often does not happen. In Pakistan, trainees still spend only around 10% of their course time on practical teaching experience. Training must not stop 
once teachers arrive in the classroom. Ongoing training should provide teachers with new ideas, especially about how to support weak learners. In Bihar state in India, the government school teachers were trained to use new learning materials adapted to the local context. And this program had a positive effect on learning. Finally, teacher educators need training too. And globally, this training of teacher educators has largely been ignored, with the result that most teacher educators have little knowledge and experience of real classroom teaching challenges and trainees' needs. The third strategy is about allocating teachers efficiently and equally. Without better allocation of teachers, few of them will teach in deprived areas. Disadvantaged students will be taught by teachers with weaker subject knowledge. And eventually students will leave school without learning the basics. There are four main factors that affect such allocation in qualities. There is an urban bias. For example, Malawi, which has one of the highest pupil-teacher ratios, 76 pupils per teacher, also manages to allocate teachers inefficiently, with the result that there are surpluses in urban schools, but severe shortages in rural, rural areas. Ethnicity and language plays a role. In Mexico, children who speak indigenous languages are often taught by teachers who have less education and training. Gender is particularly important, especially in this region. In Afghanistan, for example, there were twice as many female as male teachers in Kabul, but practically no female teachers with the minimum qualifications in Uruzgan province. And finally, especially in secondary education, subject specialization can be a constraint. In Indonesia, for example, there is a surplus of teachers at, uh, uh, for language, but shortages in computer science. Therefore, policymakers must allocate the best teachers where they are most needed. To achieve a balance of teachers across a country, some governments post teachers to disadvantaged areas, and this is considered to be one of uh, the reasons for the Republic of Korea's very strong and equitable learning outcomes, as disadvantaged groups had better access to more qualified and experienced teachers. Teachers should be provided with incentives to work in remote areas. Bangladesh has tried to provide safe housing to encourage women to teach in rural areas. The Gambia, 40% of the base salary to work in remote regions. And in China, high-performing university students are given incentives to teach in rural schools in their home provinces, including free tuition. We also identify local recruitment uh, of teachers as a possible solution to ensure sufficient teachers are working in difficult areas. But some of the most disadvantaged communities, we have to admit, lack competent applicants, especially where access in the past to primary education has been low. And that is an issue, for example, that Afghanistan is trying to address. The fourth strategy is to provide incentives to retain teachers. Salaries are one of the many factors that motivate teachers, but they are a key factor. This graph shows the daily wages of, dollar, of teachers in dollar terms. Average teacher salaries are below $10 a day in eight countries. In Liberia, for example, teachers are paid only $6 per day. Some teachers are paid even less. In Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, policymakers have responded to the need to expand education systems rapidly by recruiting teachers on low pay with temporary contracts and little training. Recruiting contracts on low pay is only though a short-term solution to filling teaching gaps. Such teachers will often end up demanding equal pay and working conditions if they are to stay in the profession. In India, contract teachers account for 16% of total. And in West Bengal state, they received just 14% of the salary paid to regular teachers. Teachers should be paid enough to meet at least their basic needs and offered the best possible working conditions. As a starting point, all countries must offer salaries that are both sufficient and competitive. Teachers also need an attractive career path that rewards those who address diversity and support weak students. But there are constraints. In Pakistan, for example, teachers have to acquire additional qualifications in order to be promoted. 
This limits the chances of those in rural areas, especially women, to get promoted. For these four strategies to be achieved, the report recognizes that there is a need for teachers to be better managed. Strong leadership is required to ensure that teachers are accountable, that they show up on time and provide equal support to all. Governments should work closely with teacher unions to formulate policies to prevent gender-based misconduct, as in Kenya. Teacher absenteeism can have major impact on learning. And strategies to reduce teacher absenteeism can only be effective if they address the root causes, such as erratic teacher pay or poor working conditions. In Bangladesh and India, absenteeism was lower when teachers were born in the district where they were working. As teachers need to find ways to supplement their low salaries, private tuition is sometimes a solution for them. But this results in the widening of inequalities, and learning becomes based on the ability to pay. In Bangladesh, a third of primary school and two-thirds of secondary school students take private tuition. We cannot ban private tuition outright, but as a minimum, teachers should not be permitted to tutor their own students. Finally, to be effective, teachers need the support of appropriate curriculum and assessment strategies. They need, policymakers need to ensure that early grade curriculum focuses on securing strong foundation skills for all and is delivered at an appropriate pace. In Vietnam, the curriculum is closely matched to what children are able to learn, paying particular attention to disadvantaged learners. But in India, pupil learning is typically far below curriculum expectations. It is important to provide education in relevant languages, to promote inclusion through the curriculum. In countries with a large population of out-of-school children and youth, Governments and donors should invest in second chance accelerated learning programs, as has been the case in Bangladesh. And governments need also to identify and support low achievers with classroom assessment. Finally, successful implementation of reform requires governments to engage more closely with teachers. Teachers are often seen as part of the problem of poor learning but actually should be seen as part of the solution. It is crucial that teachers and teacher unions are engaged in the design, development, and implementation of policies and reforms to improve education. A countrywide initiative on evidence-based information on what children are learning and how much they are learning in the form of the annual status of education report, which began in India and is now being replicated in Pakistan and other initiative, initiatives are taking place in the region. I think that gives very strong data to be able to take forward some of these initiatives um, that have been suggested, uh, both by all stakeholders who are involved in this critical area of addressing the issue of crisis of learning. We quickly move forward to a very short uh, video on the GMR. Uh, please, can we start that? To support themselves and their families. It is government's responsibility to ensure that Looking at the views from the field, as it were, with Ms. Farida Lambe, co-founder of Pratham India, to say a few words about her experiences. Uh, I'm saying thank you for two reasons. One is uh, getting me to Pakistan. This is my first uh, visit to Pakistan. So I'm extremely happy to be here. And uh, I'm more happy because uh, I'm here uh, on a subject which is extremely passionate to me because I've been in this field for almost 35 uh, years. So thank you, Bela, and thank you for the entire team for having me here. Um, having said that, uh, the two dignitaries, both the ministers, I think when you have ministers like this who are so energizing and uh, who have the political will, I think nothing is uh, impossible. And therefore, I really, really appreciate what was said by the uh, education minister in Pakistan and, of course, the education minister of Afghanistan. Uh, when we talk about India, and I'm, I'm sure my friends here know that India is a huge country, uh, and now the thrust in India has been, is really shifting from schooling to uh, learning. And we've had a long uh, journey. It has not happened uh, 
you know, it's not a one-night affair. It's been last 15 years that we've been really struggling with education. And uh, therefore, I just want to say that within the last 10 years of the UPA government, the first five years, we, were, we had this very good intervention, which that the Indian government had introduced 2% CES, education CES, which gave substantial amount of funds for primary education. And that really resulted into almost the enrollment uh, rate going up to 97%. So we have 97% enrollment now in India, which we're talking about 6 to 14 age group. The second term of the UPA government, we saw the Fundamental Right to Education Act being implemented, which is, a, which is now the fundamental right as far as the constitution goes. And because of the fundamental right to education, what we've seen now in the country is that there is access, there is infrastructure, there's more nutrition, there are more schools, there are more teachers. So there's a lot of input in the education field. And therefore, these two have really now allowed us to look at quality education. What has really happened? And I, I really want to say that India is changing. While we are saying 97% of Indian children are in school, we also have uh, girls' education uh, being promoted. But at the same time, we have what is we have four percent children out of school, and these four percent children they may sound four percent, but in terms of numbers, they are a huge number, and they all belong to the most vulnerable classes of society, and vulnerable which are children on the street, children who are begging, children who are of prostitutes, children who are in the institutions, children who are orphans, and children who are working. And I'm saying this to you because these four percent are also important. So while you're talking about enrollment on one side, we also need to look at the out-of-school children. And I think UNESCO, Pakistan government, all the regional governments here are also looking at the out-of-school children. And they do need definite different strategies. We are also plagued with this entire aspect of dropout. The children, while they go to school, they don't necessarily retain in school. And one of the reasons for not retention is low performance. Uh, and with low performance, when children feel that I'm not doing well, the parents feel that it's better that they learn something rather than being in a school when nothing is being done. And therefore, one of the aspects, one of the challenges that we have in education today in India is that while parents' aspiration for education have increased, the poorest of the pure all want to go to school, want to send the children to school. The aspirations are not going to the government public schools, but the aspirations are to government aided schools, or what we call in India the private schools. And therefore, all, all our Russell results are showing that almost 56% of our children are now in private schools, which are government aided schools, which is a huge challenge because we are looking at making the government system efficient. The other aspect is the Fundamental Right to Education Act which is reserving 25% of the children in standard one for the poorest of the poor. Now, when you're looking at both these aspects, I think what we're really looking at in India is how do we really integrate the two and how do we look at learning quality? Also, the other issue that we are really, one is really uh, dabbling with is that girls' education. While the girls' education enrollment has increased, when, you, when the girls go for higher education in terms of the adolescent girls, the ASA report is also showing that the rate of dropout within the age group of 14 to 17 is higher. And uh, I've been on some of the committees while we're working with Muslim girls and bo boys in the country, and the education report on Muslims is showing that while 94% of Muslim girls are in primary education, only 2.3% girls complete university education. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting this before you to show you also that while India is looking at 97% enrollment, uh, the mass is covered, there are certain special groups which we need to cover and we need to have special strategies for these special, uh, special groups. The other aspect of course is that while we are really talking about uh, quality, uh, all of us, as civil society partners, as Pratham, as other NGOs, we're all talking now, and I'm happy that our government is also talking about quality. So children are not learning. In spite of being in the school, children are not learning. And the UNESCO report is showing, uh, is telling you all 
But I want to be very specific about India, that why are children not learning? One of the basic reasons why children are not learning in uh, the school, if uh, the children who are in fifth standard are not having the second standard grade, about 53% are in standard one, do not know how to read alphabets, is basically because the early childhood care, though it is there as a very important program of India, which is the Integrated Child Development Scheme, does not have the base on education. So children are ill-prepared. Very often, the children who come to the government schools, or whom we are really talking about, are first-generation learners. So when they come to school, the teachers are not only teaching them, but teachers are also doing a parental role, because their parents are not doing their role. And not, I'm not blaming the parents, it's because the survival is more important than looking after the child who's going to uh, school. So the, the teachers have this double challenge of looking after the academics as well as looking after the family needs of the children because they don't have enough role models or support systems in the school. The other reason why children are not learning in school is because the RTE, the Right to Education Act, is today telling us do not we have what is called comprehensive continuous evaluation, which means also that do not have exams. Now that has been completely misinterpreted within the entire uh, education system and all the teachers that you need not have exams. When we don't have exams, there's some kind of a lethargy which gets into the teachers, gets into the parents, and gets into the entire community that we will pass ho jayenge. So when YCB pass it means that the child from second standard to fifth standard to eighth standard is being promoted without really looking at whether he has developed or whether he has achieved those competencies. And this is one of the problems today in India, all, in all the states where the learning curves have really deteriorated. They've either deteriorated in some states or they are stabilized in some states. Or there is a status quo. And we are trying to find out the reasons uh, for this. The other uh, aspect, and uh, I also want to say this, that uh, we know all the negatives, and I don't want to put in all the negatives here. I want to be an optimist, and we need to look at what we need to do. So while we know that the enrollment is high, we know that there are dropouts, we know that children are going to school, we know that the parents' aspirations are there, but we also know that children are coming to school are not learning. And if we know why they are not learning, I think we need to act. So what have we, what have we done? One of the, uh, one of the aspects with, that we are, we are telling the government, and we ourselves as Pratham have tried, is to have what we call is very basic, concrete, specific learning outcomes. And learning outcomes which teachers should understand. It is not enough for us to understand. It was rightly said in the UNESCO report that let's give teachers the ownership. Let's, let's have the teachers in confidence rather than we telling teachers what to do. Secondly, we are also saying that today the emphasis is on completing the syllabus, completing the curriculum, completing what we call grade-wise curriculum. What we are saying at Pratham, and uh, a lot of us who, are, who had now experience, and the government is also listening to us, that let's look at what we call a stage-wise uh, syllabus. Stage-wise means that if a child is in is eight year old and if he's in third standard or fourth standard, let him learn that rather than saying that he must complete the syllabus in that specific year. To tell you the truth, today in many schools in India, there are 50% children who are first generation learners. There is also what we call multi-level children because their children are at differential levels in the classroom. So you are expecting that poor teacher to be a magician who will turn around the t all the children doing great competencies in one year, which is really not possible. So what we are really looking at, and where we are working with many state governments, working with schools, we are working with communities, and we are saying, let's have specific outcome goals. And uh, you know, there's not much time to explain every example, but just to tell you in brief, whether it's in the Maharashtra government or in Bihar or in Andhra Pradesh, we have laid out these outcome goals and we're training the teachers on these outcome goals and telling the teachers that let it be textbook 
based but do not be in a hurry to complete the syllabus because if the child does not know the basics how is he to understand the history and the geography and the science lessons which is expected of a standard 5 so this this is what we are trying to do lastly i just want to say uh, basic uh, that when we are looking at teachers we are looking at schools we are looking at training uh, we at india i may uh, you may agree to disagree that i do not want to say that we want to do training for teachers because in india whether it is the sarva shiksha abhiyan or whether it is many other things which are happening there is too much training happening so what we really need to do is orient the teachers and let's ask the teachers what they can do and what they cannot do so that they can manage the children uh, together also the aspect final these are two final points and i'm going to stop here is that we need to have accountability and the accountability need not be in the hierarchy or need not be in the government we are looking at accountability with the community so when the community takes ownership for the school and when the community says that this is my school then the children are learning and we have seen this over and over again in all our programs with the government because just now under the fundamental right to education there is a legal clause saying that the, there has to be what is called a school community interaction which is called the school management committee and finally i want to say that we at pratham or we uh, in india what we've looked at is very simple interventions in the school saying that this can be done at grade 2 grade 3 grade 5 let's look at a grade wise syllabus stage wise syllabus rather than a grade wise syllabus and let's look at interventions which tell the parents that your child is actually learning so let's give a guarantee of learning because today in india and all this region parents are investing a lot in education and i think it's a duty to give them back in what their investment is and therefore we are we we are we are saying that let the basic be taught and then these doors will open for our children and i think the change uh will be done and as everybody has said that education is the greatest uh investment because we in india and in this region we are a young country and let our you know youth not be a liability we should i think capitalize them as our dividends thank you very much